I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 16. You all know this. This is the giving of the keys to St. Peter. But as we make our proclamation, let us say our prayer as we trace upon our heads together aloud. May the Lord be in our minds, our lips, and our hearts. The Lord be with you. And with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you. And may the Lord be on my mind and on my lips and in my heart. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do some say that the Son of Man is? And they said to him, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And so again, you remember our second principle. In order to understand much of the New Testament, we must think like. So having a Jewish mentality and reading this, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my. Did Jews have churches? They had two places. Jews had a synagogue in every town and village. But then they had the temple in Jerusalem, which they were required to go worship three times a year. And so what is this meaning? You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Well, in translating this, it goes back to the original, to the Greek, to the Hebrew, to the Latin. It's the word ecclesia. The word, again, any Spanish speakers here, right? The Spanish word for church is ecclesia. Everyone knows that, right? Um, I didn't know that until recently. So, <laughs> learning something new all the time. So, what does it mean to be ecclesia? Well, for a Jew to be ecclesia means to be God chose us, not them, and we are under covenant law. God has given us his blessings, his promises, and, and all we have to do is do this and not do that, and it's going to work out great for us. And so, for the Jewish mindset, this concept of being church truly means to be the chosen people of God under covenant law. Everything, again, covenant is king. This is really the key principle of understanding faith, God, and religion. Now, here at Caesarea Philippi, this is a, this is a seismic event. Because Caesarea Philippi is geographically significant because of what is present there. If you Google search this when you get home, you're going to find an image of a cliff about 150 feet tall. At the top of the cliff, the Romans had built and dedicated a temple to Caesar Augustus. And remember the Romans believed their Caesars, their political leaders, spoke with the authority of God? Insert bad political joke here at any point you want. <laughs> more things change, the more they stay the same, right? But the Caesars, so that temple was at the top. At the base of the cliff, there was a cave. It was 60 feet wide, 50 feet tall, and it had these jagged features around the mouth of that cave that made it look like molars or teeth. And it was referred to, it had two names, which I'll reveal to you in just a moment. But in this cave was a water source, and the pagans could not find the bottom. They thought it went straight down to hell. And so the pagans would offer their animal sacrifices to the god Baal in that water, in that cave. And so they would, you know, it's a huge water source. They would slit the animal's throat, sacrifice it, throw the carcass into the water. And if the blood did something, it meant God accepted it. And if it didn't, their gods rejected it. It's this whole thing. Could you imagine the pleasant odors coming from that cave? <laughs> Rotten carcasses floating in water, right? So again, so that cave had two names. But to the right of that cave was a niche carved into the wall. And this was said to be the birthplace of the god Pan. 
The god Pan was half goat, half man. He was said to be the god of shepherds and sheepfolds. And so what is happening here with Jesus and the apostles? You have Jesus, the true shepherd, the apostles, the true flock, right? You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The name of that cave, it was referred to as the jaws of death and the gates of hell. So Jesus is using visual aids. They just didn't show up randomly in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus took them there to give them this teaching. Now, as I've just pointed out, there are six changes in the in Old Testament covenant. And they said when the Messiah would come, there would be this final change of giving of the perfect covenant. This is what the Jews were expecting. So when the Messiah would come, he would render the old covenant obsolete, all of the old authorities, they're out of a job. And then the new Messiah would institute a new covenant with new leadership, new practices, new dietary regulations, all things new, right? Remember that teaching, new wine and new wineskins? All of these things are important. You can also see why the chief priests and scribes and Pharisees and all the leadership were a little upset with Jesus. Imagine having that high six-figure salary and told you're about to be out of a job, right? Poke the purse. So, when we go back, we can see the prophecy of the new covenant being made in the book of Isaiah. Now, have you ever had a non-Catholic ask you, where do you find Pope in the Bible, right? And, of course, what do you say? Isaiah 22, 22, right? Everyone, <laughs> Everyone knows that, right? No, no one does. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're not going to find the word Pope anywhere in the Bible because the word Pope is an abstraction of a principle, of a biblical principle. There are other words we use that are not found in the Bible. One of those words is Trinity. The word Trinity does not exist anywhere in the Bible. But Father, Son, Holy Spirit does, right? And so we say, one, two, three, Trinity. Let's go with Trinity. Sound good? Not that hard, right? So, so again, and there's another word that's not in the Bible. The word Bible, right? Right? There's no divinely revealed table of contents. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But when we look at this notion of where does Pope come from in the Bible... It's going to come from this passage in Isaiah 22, verse 20 and following. And again, if you're a Jew and you hear this, it's going to be confusing. And there's a reason why. Isaiah 22, 20 and following. In that day, I will call my servant Elikim, the son of Hekiah, and I will bind your belt upon him. I will clothe your authority into his hands. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place upon his shoulder the key of the house of David. What he opens, none shall shut. What he shuts, none shall open. Is it any coincidence that Jesus is quoting Isaiah twenty two twenty two? Jesus is doing this deliberately. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my ecclesia, my covenant. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed. And so now let's go a little deeper into this. What, what is the confusing passage in Isaiah twenty two twenty? The confusing passage is, he shall be a father. Because did Jews lead from a fatherly role in this, these last covenants? No, remember, they went from a, from a couple to a family to a tribe to a nation to a kingdom to a kingdom nation. So you ruled with kingly authority, right? When the king walks in the room, everyone stands and bows, right? But this says that he will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. How does a father lead? Out of sacrifice and service. That's how a father leads. I would have never been able to be here if my dad did not sacrifice and serve me and my family. It's a tremendous grace and a tremendous gift. (laughs) 
But that's not how the Jews lied, did they? They had a kingly structure, and every kingdom had a prime minister. And when the king was not present, or the king wanted to put that prime minister in charge, you know what the prime minister would do? He would walk down the street holding the giant brass keys of the kingdom down the main street. And he would go to gates, and he would open those gates with those keys, and then he would lock other ones depending on what the time and season was. And so again, the giving of the keys was indicating the office of prime minister. And so we see here that he would be a father, not a king to the people. And the father would serve out of love. And so I told you where we find Pope in the Bible. Pope, Papa, Papa, Father. You see how natural and easy this is? You see how this just makes sense? And so when where do we get Pope from? It's right here. It's a biblical principle talking about the transfer of authority of one covenant of all of the high priests into this new covenant with Peter and the apostles, right? Jesus didn't give all 12 guys the keys. He gave them to Peter. And the way this dialogue would have looked, if, 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 let's just say, Peter is standing here, I'll be Jesus and you'll be the apostles. And if you remember, Peter's original name was Simon. And Jesus changed his name from Simon. But in Aramaic, it is Kephas, which is rock. So the scripture would sound like this. Jesus would speak to Peter, you are rock. And then he would turn to the disciples. And on this rock, I will build my ecclesia, my covenant. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Meaning that these false pagan religions... The religion of politics, the religion of false sacrifice to pagan gods and the false god of shepherds and sheepfolds will not prevail against God's elect and chosen people. And I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed. And so we see Peter being established as that prime minister, this office that needs to be handed down from generation to generation. And so when we see this... um, we have to kind of address a couple principles here. Uh, the prime minister could not do anything contrary to the mind of God. If the king left and left the prime minister in charge and he started harassing the people, charging extra taxes, doing all sorts of things that were against the mind of God, what would happen when the king would get home? Well, you would need a new prime minister, right? In Texas, we'd say get a rope. So that office would be vacated expeditiously and a new prime minister would be raised up. And so we have to address what role does the Pope play and what authority does he have? Uh, When I was in the non-Catholic churches, a lot of them, uh, this notion, there was kind of a false notion that Catholic believes that the Pope is smarter than God, that the Pope is perfect and never makes any mistakes. And that's referring to Pope as being impeccable. And that's not true. Pope Francis, Pope John Paul, Pope Benedict would all tell you that they are sinners in need of God's mercy. The Pope's authority is relegated to two areas, faith and morals. Not science, not climate, not politics, right? Faith and morals. Now, there are elements of those that extend, right? But we have to recognize where those lines are. And in order for the Pope to speak and to teach, it has to be done in a very specific way. And over the years, there has been a development of our doctrine that has has limited and created a very clear way for us to know when the Pope is exercising the keys to bind and loose. So one of the ways that we know that the Pope is teaching in his full authority is that he has to write it in a specific formula and have it published. I hereby bind it upon all Christian faithful to hold the following uh, elements of faith to be true. Jesus' presence in the Blessed Sacrament, the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Immaculate Conception, things of that nature. Does that make sense? So again, if Pope Francis is on an airplane somewhere and says something, that is not, that doesn't count. Okay? And, and we have to address the elephant in the room. Because there are some things coming out of Rome that are problematic. There is a lot coming out of Germany that is an absolute mess. I mean, those people need Jesus over there. I'm just saying. And people ask me, how do I handle some of these things that come from Rome? How do I handle some of these difficult, confusing issues? 
I give two responses. My first response is this. I am in sales, not management. <laughs> right? The Pope or Cardinals is not going to get a letter from Father Ken and be like, what? I, what? What? Let's get to the balcony quick. We've got to fix this, right? No. If they're not responding to Cardinal Burke or these other Cardinals who have their peer-like authority, then they're not going to respond to me. So that's my first response. I'm, I'm in sales, not management. And my second response is this. Between your prayer and fasting and mine, we can make a difference. Amen? Amen. So we shouldn't be troubled. Writing a new blog post, watching the latest attack on the cardinals or bishops and listening to people tear down and stir up your negative emotions is that helping or hurting it is right so we're not going to do that anymore are we hey good job amen <laughs> because it's hard it's it's a challenge but the devil is a roaring lion looking for souls to devour and the devil always seeks to strike the head and so it should be no surprise to us that the same tactic the devil used before is the same tactics he's using today. And so all of this is important because it goes back to this concept of covenant, how when one is rendered obsolete, a new one is established with a similar skeletal structure, but differently manifested. So some of the things in the Old Testament was a dietary regulation, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But in the Old Testament, you had to do what? The Passover sacrifice, right? You had to take a lamb, the unblemished lamb. You had to sacrifice the lamb. You had to put the blood on the doorpost. Then you had to eat the lamb, right? If you didn't eat the lamb, your firstborn would be dead. So in this new universal covenant, what is the dietary regulation? You must eat my flesh and drink my... Right? So you can see how there's a skeletal structure is in place. There are days of obligation. There are times for fasting... Lent, and there is time for feasting, Easter, Christmas, and a whole bunch of other wonderful days, right? And good news for you, the Holy Day of Obligation, uh, the um, uh, Assumption, the um, Annunciation falls on March 25th, which is a Friday this year, so it's a big party on Friday in Lent, so you get to eat meat on that day. March 25th, look forward to it. We already have steaks planned where I'm going to be. <laughs> Serious. So, so again, so, so this is, so this is, I mean, if I, if you want to have one big takeaway in this, are we in covenant or are we not? This is the big thing that led me back to Catholicism. See, when I was going to the Protestant churches, and again, if we have any non-Catholics with us, I just want you to know how much we appreciate your presence with us. And I went from, and anyone who didn't hear the homily this weekend, I, I went from agnostic to, I was spiritual, from spiritual to non-denominational Christian. And then it was Catholicism that ultimately won me over. And these reasons I'm sharing with you are the reasons why, uh, as, as one of my friends uh, wrote a book, he, uh, he said, the Bible made me do it. Uh, he said, why did, this is Steve Ray and Tim Staples, why did they convert to Catholicism? He said, the Bible made me do it. And, you know, when I was going to the non-denominational churches, they would constantly be asking me, Ken, where are you finding these teachings in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? And so I constantly had to scour the scriptures to try to understand a Catholic teaching. And when I was there, they would say things like, Ken, listen, if you want to understand the Word of God, you just read the Word of God, you pray over it, you fast, and you let God speak to you. And I said, well, what if I misunderstand? What if I don't understand a particular scripture? Literally, this is, this is the exact conversation I had with a friend of mine a guy named Larry, and I'll withhold his name. But, but Larry said to me, he said, Ken, that's why God promised the Holy Spirit. He said, if you don't understand a scripture, you've got to wrestle with God. You've got to sit there and pray and chew on that scripture. And God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will give you the infallible understanding of that particular scripture. And so in hindsight, I get to be my own pope. See the challenge here? is that if we prayed over this and, and had the same interpretation, if, if we took a hundred of us and put us in different rooms with one scripture passage and we all read it and came out with the same understanding, that would be evidence of that. But I had a Protestant pastor, a friend of mine, 
Uh, tell me, he said, Ken, to be honest with you, he said, if you put five of us pastors in a room and give us one scripture verse, you're going to come out with six or seven different meanings. <laughs> His word's not mine. And so, so what happens here, right? Again, there has to be an authoritative understanding, and there has to be an authority by which it's given to us. And this is where that papal authority comes down. Now, again, Catholics, we do not believe in just the Bible alone. This is what many of our Protestant brothers and sisters claim, is that sola scriptura, the Bible alone, is the sole authority. And I want to reveal to us right now why there's a problem with this mentality. Um, uh, first and foremost, the Catholic mentality. The Catholic mentality, how do we come up with a Catholic teaching? Well, it has to be represented in Scripture. It has to be present somewhere in Scripture. It has to be present in the teachings of those early apostles. We call this tradition with a capital T. Not tradition with a lowercase t, right? Tradition with a lowercase t, it's not eating meat on Fridays during ordinary time. Another tradition with a lowercase t, priestly celibacy. Priestly celibacy is just a practice. That can be done away with at any time. I highly recommend we don't. Uh, I'm very happy with it. It works out quite well for the priesthood. But these are traditions with a lowercase t. Traditions with a capital T is what the apostles held to be true and handed down to their disciples, such as the teachings of the Eucharist, praying to the deceased, the saints, right? Again, things of that nature. Those are traditions with a capital T. And then the third principle, is it found in Scripture? Is it found... What, so what do we have here? We've got sacred Scripture, we have sacred tradition, and we have magisterial teaching. So again, did St. Peter and his successors hold these things to be true? So again, this is one of the problems that we had early in Pope Francis's pontificate, where he put that footnote in one of his writings about communion for divorce and remarried being permissible. Again, that directly contradicted Pope John Paul II and also Benedict XVI. And so there are several things, and it also directly contradicts things that are said in sacred scripture. So again, so this is where the dubia process came in, where the Cardinal Burke and several other cardinals asked for clarification. So when we see this, we have this three-legged stool where there gives us a check and balance. Is it found in all three places? And that makes a whole lot more sense than having a single authority. Because if it's just Bible alone, it's not just Bible alone, it's our interpretation of the Bible alone. Does that make sense? Amen? Good, this is key. So, so again, what do we have here? The part of the reason with the sola scriptura argument, the Bible alone argument, is that the Bible did not exist in its canon, in its codex, in these 27 books of the New Testament, until the late 380s, around 384 at the Council of Rome, when the first table of contents was, was published, and then it was ratified at the Council of Hippo. So literally, for the first 380 years of, of Catholicism, right, there was no Bible in print. There was no declaration of what the books of the Bible were. And there were actually two books in the New Testament that almost didn't make it. That was the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation. The book of Hebrews, the reason why the book of Hebrews almost didn't make it, because, and, and let me back up here in just a second, at these councils, what was going on is that they had all of these texts that the church uh, held to be inspired by the Holy Spirit, to be equal to the Old Testament canon, right? So every time St. Paul refers to Scripture, he's not referring to his writings or the writings of the apostles, right? When Peter, James, uh, and John, and St. Paul, when they were writing, they didn't know they were writing Scripture, they were writing to the other people, right? And I'm pretty sure if they knew they were writing scripture and that their writings would be preserved for, for 2,000 years, St. Paul would have not started his letter with, Oh, stupid Galatians. <laughs> I'm sure he would have wordsmithed a little bit there, right? So they did not know they were writing scripture when they were writing. They were simply writing what they knew to be true under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And there's a great section in on the catechism that explains this process. But the church for the first, from the, from the time of the death and the martyrdom of the apostles into the 100s, the 200s, the 300s, they had all of these texts and all of these letters 
that they held to be inspired by God. They recognized that that was the Holy Spirit. And, but there were also more than 27. There were up to 40 or 50 that the church held to be true. But the church, the authority of the church, said we need to come up with a very specific criteria when we come up with the canon of the New Testament, namely that it had to be original source writers. The writings of St. Clement I, the first pope after St. Peter, were considered to be inspired and amazing. We still have those writings available to us today. But the church drew the line at Peter and excluded Clement in the following writers to keep it simple and as distilled as possible. And so the church came up with these 27 books. And so there was this whole process. And what they did is they had to take all of the scrolls. It wasn't just one or two scrolls. They got as many copies of each book of the Bible and went through it diligently. And so some scriptures had things added to it. Other ones, you were short on parchment, so you would write down what you could, right? And so they would exclude the ones that had errors, and they would find the ones that paralleled as closely as possible. And those were the ones that were determined as the authoritative scriptures, right? And so it was this whole process to determine what books would be included in the New Testament, right? The, the Bible, the, the, the New Testament Bible, the New Covenant Bible. And so I'm sure you have all heard this. Um, uh, many non-Catholics will say to us Catholics, uh, you added seven books to the Old Testament. And that's fair. I get it. I see where you're going. But, but real quick, um, if the Catholics could determine and figure out what books should be in the New Testament, I mean, can't we get the Old Testament right? I'm just saying, just, just bear with me here. Now, now let's watch. How, now, why, why is there a difference? Well, the answer is in the culture of the Jews. You don't have to read much of the New Testament to see that you have different factions within the Jews, right? You had the Pharisees, you had the scribes, you had the Essenes, you had the synagogue of the freemen, you had the Sadducees. And each one of them were, were their own thing. Like the Pharisees and Essenes, right? The Essenes were OCD. Dead serious. The Pharisees were just legalists, but the Essenes were OCD. So literally, one of the teachings, if you pour water from, a, from a, a clean pitcher, you know, remember clean and unclean? If you pour water from a clean pitcher into an unclean vessel, as that water goes, does the pitcher become unclean? Can the uncleanliness travel upstream? Um, this, is, this was a real question. I'm dead serious. The Pharisees said, no, uncleanliness does not travel upstream. The Essenes said it did. Okay? All right. Why do we have more books? Because we follow the scriptures that Jesus sampled from, the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus referenced. All right? I am going to point out to you why books of that, about the resurrection do not exist in the Protestant Old Testament because they have followed different Protestant uh, no, Jewish sects. The Sadducees, now you're going to hate me, uh, forgive me, I do not want to do this, but I'm going to do it. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's why they're so sad, you see. I know, boo, boo, right? Uh, it's horrible, right? But you're never going to forget that, right? Yeah. But would the Sadducees have the book of Maccabees or the book of Tobit that talked about praying for the dead in it? No. And so, so same thing with Martin Luther. What was the big thing that Martin Luther was upset about? The sale of indulgences that were related to the dead, right? Now, again, when you look at, back at the Protestant Reformation, one historian wrote, started his commentary on the Protestant Reformation. He was a Catholic. The first words of his history were, was, something had to be done. Something had to be done. Meaning that the corruption in the church was so horrific. It was so bad. The, the, the purity of the teaching of Jesus Christ was so perverted, and the people were being taken advantage of. And so Martin Luther, Calvin, and Zygwiggle come together with this notion of wanting to restore the church back to its original grandeur to make it more beautiful, to return it to its original purity. And now you, we have a great example of that. 
This church, right, for those of you who are visiting, this church just opened up two weeks ago. It was truly renovated. And it looked similar to this, didn't it? It looked very similar to this prior to the renovation. But after the renovation, it looked more beautiful, more prayerful, more godly. Amen? Amen. And you should be very proud of this, right? There is so much to be proud of here at St. Mary Magdalene. But imagine if you came back after the revelation, after the renovation, and there was a water slide over here, and there was... You know, so, you know it, it, it didn't look like a church at all, right? The, the tabernacle was over there. The altar was over here. The ambo was back here. There was all sorts of crazy stuff all around, right? Now, again, I'm not saying that's what the Protestants did, but in effect, this is the way it has turned out. And, and I want, if you just be patient with me and, and hear me out on this, because Martin Luther, Calvin, and Zwickel came up with 15 points of criteria. And they believed that those 15 points were the authentic doctrine. And if we could just get back to those 15 points, we we could restore Christianity and Catholicism. They had no intention of breaking off. They wanted a restoration. I think their intentions were pure. But also, there was a lot of misgivings in this. Again, um, um, I won't get into that. We don't have time for that. But upon the beginning of the Reformation... As they reached the apex of their decisions on these 15 points, there was one point, and it was the final point, that all three men disagreed on. It was the teaching, this is my body. Calvin said one thing, Zygwickel said another, and Martin Luther said a third. So at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, which was supposed to bring us all back together, there were already three splits that took place. To be a Protestant means to protest. To protest what? The teachings of the Catholic faith. Do you realize for the first 1,500 years there was only Catholicism? I mean, this is a historical fact. And now we have this this fracture, right? And it starts off with three. Well, how did that, you know, hey, maybe it's like a rough, maybe it's like the Cincinnati Bengals, right? You know, get off to a rough start, but you kind of bring it back together, right? It takes a little bit to get traction, but we, we pulled it back together. Did, did the Protestantism, did it come back together or did it continue to splinter? Well, I have some numbers for you. Every 10 years, the uh, U.S. Census Bureau does a census. And one of the things it asks for, it, it questions in America, are the number of Christian denominations In 1982, there were 21,000 Christian denominations. 20 years later, from 82 to 2002, there were 33,800 Christian denominations in America. 2012, 41,000 Christian denominations. So, what happened? It continued to split and split and split and split. Right? Remember that, that, that... Uh, principle my friend Larry gave me. Ken, if you misunderstand a Bible verse, you read about it, you pray about it, you chew on it, and then God will give you that infallible meaning. So as a non, if I'm going to my favorite Protestant church, the church of whatever, and I'm going there and the and pastor stands up and he says, today, my brothers and sisters, we're going to preach on. And then he says my favorite verse and I'm all excited. He's going to preach on my favorite verse. I can't wait to hear how right I was, right? And pastor preaches on my favorite verse, and he gets it wrong. What do I do? As a good, faithful Protestant man, I will go up to pastor and say, Pastor, can I speak with you in charity, please? Pastor, you were talking on this verse, and I have been chewing on that and praying on that for a long time. And and pastor, I think you just, I think you might be a little off. I think you might have got it wrong. And the pastor will say, Brother, thanks be to God. Thank you for coming to me in charity. Let's pray this week. Let's fast these next three days and let's get together on Friday and let's talk about this. And if you and I can't come to a conclusion, we're going to invoke the elders and we'll bring the elders in and then we'll bring the commentaries in and we're going to figure this out and for the glory of God. That's what happens. But as we have this dialogue, if we can't come to an agreement, what must I do in conscience? I need to go down the road to a church that shares my understanding of that scripture. And again, this can happen so many times, so many times, to the point where one feel, may feel called to start their own church. Right? So this is, again, did our Lord say, Father, may they be many? 
No, Jesus prayed in the John chapter 17, Father, may they be as we are. Again, this is, this is hugely important. God does not like division. God does not want these disagreements. And again, Christ has given us his covenant with the fullness of the faith. We do not look down upon our brothers, Protestant brothers and sisters uh, running our nose up at them. I guarantee every single person here knows a non-Catholic who is an exemplary man or woman. Amen? Amen. And, and they run circles around most Catholics. I mean, they're sitting there with their Bible just consuming the Word of God. It's marked up. It's turned inside and out. It's incredible. You know, I'm going to share with you one of the things that changed my life. When I was going to the Bible churches, specifically Hyde Park Baptist Church in Austin, Texas, uh, my roommate brought me there, and I was still doubting God at this point. I was just kind of going to check it out to have an open mind and heart. And this youth minister was running around, and he was all excited, and he goes, do you want to change your life forever? And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Depends what the ask is. <laughs> he said this. He said, if you want to change your life forever, I want you to go home, and I want you to pick up the New Testament. And I want you to read one chapter of the New Testament every day. He said, if you do that, that will change your life forever. Now, really quick, how long is a chapter of the New Testament? Okay, this is the book of Thessalonians. The entire book of Thessalonians, right? There's chapter 1, there's chapter 2, and there's chapter 3, right? So a chapter in the New Testament is sometimes one single column. Back here in the Gospel of John, sometimes it's two full pages. So we're not, I mean, we're, we're, what are we dealing with? Three minutes, maybe ten minutes? So three to ten minutes a day in the New Testament will change your life forever. And so he said do it for like two months. I think that's what he said. Try doing it for two months and it will change your life forever. Then he said this. If you doubt God's existence, start in the Gospel of John. And so I sat back and I said, you know what? I'm going to take your challenge and when you're wrong, I'm going to come back, thump you on the head with the Bible, give it back to you and tell you I don't have to believe. You want to know what the irony of all of this is? is that we owe Hyde Park Baptist Church in Austin, Texas, a debt of gratitude for my vocation to the Catholic priesthood. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, again, I do not reject any of my Protestant past. I'm so grateful for it, the love of Scripture, praise and worship, right? The love of God, the zeal, the, the apologetics, I, I got to bring all of that with me into a new treasury. As I said on Sunday, again, this being God, we, man, we have, a, we have a message, we have a word for our non-Catholic brethren because you can truly come into the very presence of God, not just sit with His omnipresence in the Scriptures. So again, here we are, the very beginning of Lent. I'd like to make you that challenge. I'd like to challenge you. Do you want to change your life forever for the better? Then take the rest of Lent. And I want you to read just one chapter of the New Testament every day. And if you doubt God's existence, start in the Gospel of John. Amen? Amen. Good. I got 100% participation. Good job, Father. <laughs> it will. It'll change your life. Again, our Protestant brothers and sisters just have the Word of God, and they do so much with it. And we Catholics do so little. And we can do better. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's do that. I want to conclude our, our conversation today with this notion. And again, what I'm about to say only relates to a small portion of non-Catholics. There's a small portion of non-Catholics that refer to the Catholic Church as the Whore of Babylon, that barely consider Catholics to even be Christian. Um, do you guys know that, do, uh, that, that person, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn? Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was one of those people who considered the Catholic Church the whore of Babylon and that we barely qualified as Christians. And they would say that Catholicism has perverted Christianity to such a degree, and it was never, ever right. And so the question is this. Our Protestant brothers and sisters say this is the inheritable, in, in, it's the impeccable, perfect word of God, right? There's no errors in this Bible, amen? And that's a true statement. 
But some, this small group, say the Catholic Church is the most corrupt, rotten group within all of Christianity. And so from a logic perspective, just from pure logic, can you get the perfect fruit from the most rotten fruit tree? It's impossible. Can you get the perfect contents from an imperfect vessel? No, in order to get the perfect contents, you have to have a perfect vessel. Amen? Amen. And we'll talk about her tomorrow. Yeah, I see what I did there. Yeah? (laughs) You like that? That was a good one. So you have to have the authority. You have to have the... Again, the church is made up of fallible and broken people. Right? There was some, something happened in World War II where some German general was pounding and saying, and he was yelling at this cardinal, we, we will destroy the church. And this cardinal looked at him and said, listen, we've been trying to do it for 1,800 years. You, <laughs> just save yourself some energy. Right? Again, this is proof positive that it's a divine institution. I want to end our night tonight with a question, a Protestant question. Our Protestant brothers and sisters will often ask, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Amen. And I want to ask us that question, because I know i got a lot of yeses and nodding heads here. But I know there are some here that were like me, that might have not known, that might be just going through the motions, that you've been coming to church for a long period of time, but to truly surrender yourself and to live by God's law, to follow Jesus Christ, to say, I believe and I will submit to what you ask of me, God, not I will do it my way, right? I will pray, I will keep faith, I will observe what you would ask me, I'll do what you say and avoid what you say to avoid. There are some here that may struggle with that. How do we respond to that question? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I'll tell you the story of a good friend of mine, Tom Dixon. Tom Dixon, 44 years old, beautiful man, husband, beautiful wife, three wonderful teenage children, lying in his hospital bed, dying of stomach cancer. Tom was a devout man, convert to Catholicism. And his father-in-law, Kathy's Kathy's dad, would come in to visit him. And he would bring, he wasn't Catholic, he was a a non-denominational Bible Christian, And he would bring his Bible with him every time he would visit Tom. And they would just read scripture together and they would talk about the word of God together. And one day, after reading the word and visiting for a little bit, the father-in-law slides close to Tom and he grabs his hand and he places his Bible on his chest. And he gives him a little squeeze and he goes, Hey, buddy, we're getting close. And Tom goes, Yeah, Dad, I know. I know I'm going to die but it's okay. And Tom's father-in-law said to him, pal, I wouldn't be doing my job as a Christian if I didn't ask you. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because if you haven't, Tom, I can lead you in that prayer right now. I can walk you through the sinner prayer. You can be sorry for your sins. You can repent and believe in the Word and the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And you can be sure when you die in these next few days, you will stand before the throne of God, hearing these words, Well done, my son. Enter into the joy of your father's house. And Tom squeezed his father's hand to his chest and said, Dad, have I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior? Every day. Every day I have to wake up and accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. It's not enough to do it once, is it? Sometimes it's minute by minute, isn't it? Right? And so again, Tom gave that perfect Catholic answer. He gave on, went on to say, Father, if I break covenant, I go to confession where I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb, where Christ's mercy is waiting for me, where I know that I have the surety of being in the state of grace and that when I die, whether it's this moment or the next, that I am confident I will hear the words, Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. My dear brothers and sisters, if you're able to, I'd like to invite you to kneel at this time. I'd like to invite you just to gaze upon Jesus in the Eucharist. 
Some of you know Jesus very well. Some of you may not. I invite you to invite Jesus into your heart in a new way today. The first words of the gospel were, repent and believe. Jesus inviting us to be sorry for our sins and to believe in terms of an action, to live out what he's given us in this covenant. So I'd like each of you, whether this is the millionth time, or maybe for some of you the first time, to surrender to Jesus. Say, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my all. All that I have is yours. I believe. Help my unbelief. And help me follow you all the days of my life. And if you've broken covenant in any way, big or small, come to confession. And let us join together in singing the down in adoration falling, the tantum ergo sacramentum. Your response will be, having within it all sweetness. You have given them bread from heaven, having within it all sweetness. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave us the Eucharist as a memorial of your suffering and death. May our worship of this sacrament of your body and blood Help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom, for you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. This part of our evening is referred to as the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. It is our Lord himself who will be blessing you. So receive our Lord's blessing by tracing the sign of the cross over yourselves.
you would pray with me the divine praises, blessed be God, blessed be his holy name, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man, blessed be the name of Jesus, blessed be his most precious blood, blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. Your response to this final prayer will simply be, Amen. May the heart of Jesus, in the most blessed sacrament of the altar, be praised, adored, and loved with grateful affection at every moment and all of the tabernacles of the world, even until the end of time. Amen. If you please stand and join us in singing, Holy God, we praise thy name. We pray. Father, it's so wonderful to see so many of you and all of you here this evening. Tomorrow we will have a problem, so we need to expand the church tomorrow, right? Because we need to invite each of us, invite one more person to come tomorrow so that we can have a, a very full and fuller church. But thank you for being here this evening. As you are stepping out, be aware the Spanish community are about to conclude their own too. So if you hear the ringing of a bell, the Blessed Sacrament is coming. So you want to move aside and kneel or genuflect as the Blessed Sacrament is coming from the FLC into the chapel over here. So just be aware of that. And also, if you want to go to confession this evening, Father, we'll be going back in into the confessional uh, very soon. And as you leave also, if you want to uh, give a donation to support the, the missionary work of the Fathers of Mercy, there are baskets as you exit the church uh, at, in the, through the Nortex over there. And if you want to buy one or two of the CDs and books that Father brought, they are also available in the Nortex. Thank, thank you so much for coming this evening, and see all of you tomorrow. Good evening. <laughs>